this is EliteSportsBetting.com. I'm your host, Claudia Bellafato, here with CEO of EliteSportsBetting.com and professional gambler for the last 15 years, Rob Brink. We're going to break down the most asked questions in terms when it comes to betting, a little beginner's guide for you beginner bettors. And Rob, before you place any bet, you need to decide how much money you're putting down, which is different for every better. So explain what a bankroll and unit size is. So this is really misunderstood. So really a bankroll is the amount of money that you have in a betting account that you're willing to bet. The average daily better, they just wait for the paycheck to come in, reload the bankroll and bet what new money they have. Um, if we're talking about a professional sports gambler, they have some size of an account. And um, the other misnomer, Claudia, is people hear unit and they think, oh, it's 50 bucks, it's 25 bucks. There's a, there's a real measure of what your unit size should be, and it refers to 1% of your bankroll. Um, if you're doing uh, like formal staking methods, which we probably won't get into uh, on this show, um, you know, you, that's very critical. But in general, when somebody says a unit, um, it should represent 1% of the bankroll that you have available. Again, I know that doesn't happen with people, but that's what it means. All right, like I said, that is different for everyone. So if you think your unit size is too small, it is not too small. It is whatever works for you. Let's move on to money line versus point spread, Rob. So the money line traditionally is the um, negative or the positive that you will see, and that is minus your money or times your money, right? So if you place a $1 bet at minus 160, you lose 40 cents on that bet. If you place a dollar bet at plus 160, you gain 60 cents on that bet, assuming you win. The money line odds are directly correlated to the win percentages that the bookmakers put on a game. And then they are kicked around a little bit based on whether sharp money's coming in or the public is flooding a single side. Um, but when a money line is made, it is a correlation to the win probabilities of that event and then you are either laying or um, getting um, juice on your juice on your dollar. Um, so that's how the money line works. And then a point spread is the same sort of uh, handicapping method where you, you, you essentially are just taking um, those probabilities and deducting or adding points to a side. So if the Wizards are plus four, you're getting four points on the Wizards. If the uh, Lakers are minus seven, you are laying or losing seven points on the Lakers. And of course they do that to even out that probability. So if that game on a money line, let's say is 60, 40. So the, the money line odds are somewhere around 170 at a 60% bet probability. Um, that corresponding uh, spread will be around seven. So that's how those numbers are made. And on another video, we could talk about, we could get a little deeper into that because there is some science there, but that's in general what it means. And Rob, you mentioned a few terms that people might be confused with, especially when it comes to money line or spread. And you see a number and you see one is minus and the other is plus. So explain what those means in correlation with a dog and a favorite. So the dog is always plus and the minus is always the favorite. Um, and again, um, there will be some corresponding point spread as well against those numbers. And the point spread also has a VIG attached. Um, so the point spread is always going to be minus 17, minus 110, or minus 17, plus 100. Plus 100 would be even money. Um, but there's always some juice that you're going to pay even on the point spread. However, that juice is generally going to be much lower than just playing a money line favorite. At a, at a much um, higher number. And Rob, explain what juice is. <laughs> so juice is the, the, the amount of money you pay to keep the bookmakers lights on. So uh, the, in, in sports betting, um, there is, there is a, a, a number that's built into uh, the odds that pays the bookmakers um, salaries and casinos to keep the lights on. Um, so if a true probability is 50, 50, that is a money line of 100. Okay. You will never see 100 on both sides. Um, in football, let's say if it's 50% probability, they will add 15 cents to 20 cents of VIG. Um, and so that number moves to minus 135, even though it's a true, 
um, hundred point or um, even bet. Um, and there are some some calculations that I run that we run to remove the vigorish out of the out of the money line so that you could see what the pure odds makers probability is. Um, but the vig is the amount of money you pay to um, get free cocktails in the casino. So the vig and juice, because you will see both terms are basically one and the same. Vigorish, vig, juice, all the same thing. All right. And then people might hear the term handicapping. In simple terms, what is handicapping? When I hear somebody say they're a handicapper, I want to punch them in the face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's so overly used it's so and handicapping is a it really comes from the eu i, I talked to a lot of betters in europe and they, they talk a lot about handicappers and that all comes over here and when somebody says they handicap the game they essentially did whatever research they feel like they had to do to give themselves some edge on the game 98% of it's total crap. But um, when you hear somebody say they're a handicapper, that just means that they research the bets that they're going to make. And what is an edge? So an edge, th this is a great question, Claudia. So back in the day at a horse track, you would get your edge by reading uh, the, the, reading the, the cards, right? Reading the uh, horse forms, um, the race booklets. Uh, you would get a newspaper from out of town. I, I literally used to know people that would fly to other, um, fly to other cities to get the local newspaper um, so that they could find out what was going on with that local team because the internet didn't exist. So people used to formulate edges by literally traveling and trying to find um, things that were unknown about the team. So this is a really deep conversation. I'm sorry, but the, this still, goes, terms, I said. <laughs> this still goes on to some degree. Like people try to find out injuries before other people and then right, get down. Right. Um, so that's one form of edge. That's an information edge. Mm -hmm. And information edges in the day, of, um, the day we live in of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the internet, are, they're gone basically. And, unless you know the team trainer and they tip you off that somebody has a broken ankle before the game, you don't know. So information edges are largely gone. Um, now there's edges to be had in the markets um, where people make their livings uh, scraping lines or doing arbitrage, which would mean just trading back and forth lines across books that are off numbers. Mm -hmm. That's gotten restricted as well, just because there's so much information sharing out there. Um, to answer your question, uh, an edge as I would make it using a computer model would be a calculated mathematical edge over the odd makers posted number. Um, but in, 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 in practice in, in theory for most people, an edge just means you have something on that game that you think uh, gives you an advantage. And there might be some handicappers who would handicap a game, think they have enough edges and say that play is a lock. And why do we not like locks? Rob? Well, that handicapper that thinks he has an edge has no edge on the market. Um, I can assure you of that. Uh, but uh, there, there is, so uh, the, I remember betting um, the, the Dodgers at minus 300 um, for a sizable bet. And that Dodgers team lost that game to some crap team by, I don't know, three runs, four runs, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about a 300 favorite, that is something like 72% to win the game uh, or an 80% favorite um, or a Floyd Mayweather in a fight that is a minus 1100 favorite. Um, those people, a lot of people will call those locks because this is a cannot lose bet. Unfortunately, in my Dodgers story, I lost like a, I don't know, a nice car. So uh, yep. Every bet has the possibility of losing no matter how much handicapping you do. You cannot predict every game. Yes. No, not, not, even, not even close. And if you think you can, just find a new hobby. Right. All right, let's get into opening and closing line. And more importantly, closing line value. So the opening line, uh, I, I've got an article on elite sports betting about how lines are formed. But the opening line for an event um, if we just use, let's use NFL football, because that's one of the most popular things for people to bet on. Mm -hmm. That line will come out Sunday evening at some point for the next week's games. And it will come out at a low, um, at a low uh, amount of money that you could bet on it. It's capped. 
So you might only be able to bet $2,500 on it or something. It's very low. And mm -hmm. they do that because they want to see what happens when they put that number in the market. So there's this real misconception, Claudia, that bookmakers are smarter than or no more than um, the people that are gambling. It's simply not true. They just have the ability to put a number out there, see what the market liquidity does to that number, and then they adjust. So over the life cycle of an opening line uh, for an NFL game, for example, you know, it's bet until about Monday night or Tuesday, and then they peel the cap off and you could bet 50, 100 grand on the game. And then the sharp money starts coming in and that number really starts moving um, until it hits the closing line, which is at the beginning of the event. So in football, when they kick off, the number closes. So think about that in terms of a life cycle of a line. And you mentioned sharp money. Can you explain what sharp money is? So sharp money is not the guy on Twitter that um, has a lot of followers and thinks he's really smart. Sharp money is literally uh, uh, generally identified by the bookmakers because they see that person's account and know what he's betting on and winning or collecting a lot of CLV or whatever. So when you hear the term sharp money, it's generally identified by a sports book. Um, by the way, if that account is so sharp, the sports book generally cuts them off. But um, so you hear the term sharp money, but that really means professional gamblers, uh, maybe syndicated money where it's coming in in a group um, to avoid getting shut off. Um, but so that's when you hear sharp money, that's what it means. But most of the people that are think they're sharp money, it's not sharp money. Uh, and this kind of leads into my next question, reverse line movement. Can you explain what that is in simple terms? Sure. And, and I will caution the audience that I would pay zero attention to the reverse line movement. It is a totally worthless indicator, but I'll tell you what it is. It is, it is when, so, so there's a ticket count or a money count that you could see, and it is how many tickets are on the Lakers tonight, how many tickets are on the Rockets tonight, whatever. And you will see the, game, the other side of that number move. So all the tickets are on the over but it all of a sudden moves under. So what that means is either a sharp account at a sports book is taking a position that is opposite the public money, or they're getting sums of money on that side that require them to move the number to, you know, they're, they're risk managing. So they're trading it down to manage their risk. And total, I'm, this one might be one of the more simple plays, but can you explain what a total is? So a total is just the projected outcome of, the total points scored in an event. And there's two kinds of totals, really. You could bet the over or an under on a full game total. You could bet the over or the under on a half total. And I guess there's another one. You could also bet over, under on team totals as well. Yep. All right, let's talk alternative line. So, again, avoid alt line betting at all costs. Um, alt line betting is there for the bookmaker to make more money. So, um, there is a reason that they will let you, um, so if the Lakers are minus seven, they will also give you the option to bet the Lakers minus 10 at better odds at better juice. So if they're minus seven, minus one ten, the minus one ten or minus 10 might be plus 200. Um, they're not giving you those points or, or not. They're not giving you those extra points of big, those extra points of juice uh, because they're nice people, um, those bets will lose more than they will win. Um, so I would not alt-line bet personally. So for beginners, he's giving you some good tips here. Probably the safest place would be going money line or a spread, betting on the dog or the favorite. There's also parlays and teasers. Can you explain what that is? Sure. And so uh, a parlay, again, they don't let you do this because they're your friend, Claudia. They're not your friend. Uh, a parlay is when you could take more than one single event and roll them into a single wager. So um, if we have the Rockets and we have the Lakers, we combine them into one bet. If the Rockets are minus 120 and the Lakers are minus 150, you roll them into the one bet, you get plus 120 on the outcome. So anyone who has bet a single, a single event realizes how hard it is to pick the outcome of that event. Now you're taking two independent events and combining them. So you have to be right twice. 
Um, one of the more frustrating things for me as sports betting becomes more mainlined is that you see 11 team parlays, 12 team parlays, and people use this as fodder uh, on, on, on Twitter and things. And I could just assure you, for every person that wins that $10 11 team parlay for 50 grand, there are thousands and thousands and thousands that have lost. And the bookmaker is just fine paying that 50,000 to that one person. Mm -hmm. All right, Rob, uh, teasers, before we, oh, oh yeah, teasers, teasers. teasers. <laughs> so <laughs> I bet teasers in NFL and there is a, God, I feel like I'm going to betting 202. You could Google Wong teaser. There's a mathematical equation you can do on teasers, but in the NFL, but a teaser is when a bookmaker will let you, again, you have to combine a minimum of two events. So if we just use an NFL point spread, the Steelers are minus six, the Bengals are minus seven. You combine them in the one event, you tease them down six points. So now you're getting the Steelers at pick them and the Bengals at minus one. Um, so you're taking the two teams and teasing down their point spreads. Um, I will caution the NFL is a great place to do this. Nowhere else is do not tease totals. Do not even look at something like this in baseball. Like, NFL is the place to run teasers. Do not tease a college basketball total uh, or I'll find you. Some great tips from a veteran. And what would be your biggest piece of advice for a beginner better? Uh, I think set your expectations properly and find a community. So I'm fortunate enough that I have a great community, a great system of, 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 of real sports bettors that I talk to daily. Uh, we fortunately have that at uh, Elite Wins, at Elite Sports Betting for people to come in. But I think find a community and set reasonable expectations. Uh, very few people can build a house on um, gambling wins. Uh, it should be really entertaining for you. It certainly could be a profitable uh, hobby if you don't take unnecessary risks and build a community around yourself. It's fun. Just keep your unit size small when you're starting out. <laughs> That's all you got to do. All right, guys, if you have any more questions or want the latest advice and tips on daily betting for all sports, follow us on Twitter at EliteWins and online at EliteSportsBetting.com. Thanks for watching.